Um, now I'm going to be introducing Lou Schoenberger from uh, Sandia National Lab. He's a staff scientist there in high energy density plasma theory. He has a PhD in physics from the University of Illinois and held a postdoctoral research appointment at the Geophysical Laboratory of the Carnegie Institution for Science. His research focuses on developing electronic structure techniques with an emphasis on exotic phenomena. He is a longtime developer of QMC PAC and Quantum Mart Monte Carlo code, and is now a co-PI of an effort to make it one of the premier codes for the next generation of supercomputers. Uh, he is also the co-PI of the Center for Predictive Simulation of Functional Materials. And today he will be uh, telling us about exploring the interplay between theory and experiment in the study of materials under extreme conditions. Great, thank you very much. And it's wonderful to be able to talk to you. So one of the things that I'd like to really uh, get across in this talk is a bit of a snapshot of what it's like to work in the national labs. And one of the great things about that is you get to confront really large problems, but you also get to have really large teams of sort of diverse people to work on those problems. So um, the instance that I'm going to give you is, is sort of from uh, my own area at Sandia, which is looking at dynamic materials properties, so materials under extremes of temperature and pressure generally. And we're able to, to do a lot of interplay between theory and experiment. So the theory is helping out the experiment, and then the experiments will also drive theory. So there are uh, several ways that the National Labs, is sort of in, in my area, learn about materials under extreme conditions. So um, I guess there was a tour yesterday. A lot of you got to see the National Ignition Facility. This is one of sort of the premier laser platforms to drive materials to high temperatures and pressures. Uh, at Sandia, we have the Z-Machine that we'll use to do a more sort of mechanical loading of materials to get to high temperatures and pressures. Uh, diamond anvil cells are a, a static way to achieve that, that I learned a fair amount at my postdoc. And then sort of my bailiwick is using supercomputers in order to try to solve quantum mechanical equations that will tell us about how materials uh, perform under any sort of conditions, hopefully. So in particular, in this talk, I'm going to talk about how we couple um, what we're learning from our computer simulations and what's going on in our experiments. So uh, drilling down a little bit, because it's sort of a, a large topic, I'm going to focus on hydrogen. So this is uh, something that, that comes up in a lot of different contexts that we're interested in, from sort of giant planets to fusion capsules to even um, I've done a fair amount of work talking to people who are looking at white dwarves, and the, uh, the atmospheres of white dwarves can be a really interesting laboratory for looking at, at hydrogen. And then, of course, there's the uh, potential hydrogen economy. So there's no shortage of applications. So we want to use Z in order to drive hydrogen to really high temperatures and pressures, for instance, to inform what's going on with our fusion concepts. So the way that, that this works is that the Z machine has these sort of huge capacitor banks around the outside that store megajoules of electrical energy that then in this sort of lightning show are going to get shaped down into a pulse that lasts only a few nanoseconds and generates enormous currents, so mega amp scale currents. And what we do is right at the center of this thing, we do, you know, kind of the, uh, in some sense, you know, your, your um, electrical experiment at home gone wrong, we've just put a short across it. And what happens is that the, uh, the current is going to flow along this cathode and anode. And at these very high, high currents, we're going to generate really strong magnetic fields in this gap. So what's going to happen is that magnetic field is then going to explode out the cathode, uh, sorry, the anode. And we're going to use that to do a dynamic materials experiment. So basically, I stick something here that I'm interested in. This is going to hit it at really high velocities. And I'm going to watch what happens. Now, it turns out it's not just so simple as, as generating something at those high pressures. I want to understand exactly what's going on there. Now, this figure isn't showing up really well, but what it's trying to say is that if I know the properties of this, this uh, anode that I'm shooting into the material that I'm studying really well under a variety of, of high pressures and temperatures, I can use sort of my knowledge of how fast this was coming in and that knowledge in order to back out the properties of the material that I'm trying to study. Now, something that, that was learned far before I got to Sandia 
is that in order to precisely control these experiments, you have to be a little bit careful in how you're dumping all this current into the short. So it turns out that along this, this drive surface, along the back surface, let's say, of the anode, the current is going to melt the flyer. And if you don't do this very carefully, that melt is actually going to propagate all the way through. So instead of hitting your, your sample with some nice you know, slug of material that you understand, you're basically flying goo at it at a really high velocity. And that's a lot harder to model. So um, one nice thing about the way Z is designed is that we're actually able to shape that current pulse in a variety of ways. So if we know enough about the conductivity, let's say, of the anode that we're putting out there, we can design this current pulse so we still achieve really high pressures, high velocities, but we know that the front surface of the material is in a state that we understand very well. So, you know, we have to, to generate this model of conductivity at extreme conditions. One way about going, that we can go about this is experimentally. So there are these uh, experiments where you make a really thin wire, let's say I'm using aluminum in this case, and you pass a large current through that. And what's going to happen is that this wire down here is going to explode, sort of in the same way, right? You know, um, it's going to, to melt off and then, and then really rapidly expand. So you image that explosion with some sort of high-speed camera, and then you have this problem where you, you're basically running a forward simulation, right? So you know something about the equation of state of the wire that you had, you have a guess of the conductivity of the material, tamper, things like that, and you're going to start fiddling with the conductivity model until you come to some conclusion. So this means that you have to know a whole lot about everything in your experiment in terms of its equation of state already, and you have this forward problem with only certain regimes that you can access. I can only do access certain conditions with the, say, currents that I'm generating. So another way that we'd like to go about this is to just calculate the properties of the material from first principles, right? So we know the governing equations for the electrons that are the tricky bit in any material, right? It's just the, sh the time-independent Schrodinger equation that I'm going to need to solve for most of these properties. And the tricky bit, of course, is that this is a function of, of n variables, right? So I need to solve a three-dimensional partial differential equation where that n is the number of electrons that I'm using to represent my material. So that gets really difficult really quickly, and of course, we need to make approximations. So I'd rather not bore you to death with exactly what those approximations are, so I'm going to go to uh, an analogy. And this is the idea of, let's say I want to understand interactions in an economy, so capital flow. And I'm going to start out with just a few actors, so think a few electrons in my case. So I've got all these different actors. If it's small enough, I can just track all the transactions, right? I know exactly how they're exchanging money and how my economy works. So the strength of this is that it's exact, right? There's no information that I don't know. I can watch everything. The weakness, of course, is that the cost of this grows prohibitively as the size of problem I want to look at grows. So this is sort of analogous to quantum chemistry-based wave function methods. Now, the economic problem only grows as the square of the number of actors, right? I have to keep track of any possible link between any two actors. But the electronic structure problem, where I'm actually looking at, at solving Schrodinger's equation, grows much more rapidly than that, right? I can only get to a few electrons before this end of the seventh or n factorial is going to kill me. So, okay, take a step back. Now I want to study something large. Maybe what I can do is, is do a bunch of studies of these small systems where I can track everything. So I want to understand how, for instance, uh, money flows in a rural economy. I want to look at what's going on on the floor of, of Wall Street. And then I'm going to stitch it together and basically just say that my entire economy here of the United States is composed of, of different population densities. I know what's going on in each population density and I can put it together. So the nice thing about this is it does scale well to larger economies, right? I can, I can figure out you know, what things are going to look like for my entire United States or, in my electronic structure problem, my entire material. The difficulty is that if there are rare but important factors, I may miss this. So for instance, if I model Omaha, Nebraska as a rural 
place, I might miss Berkshire Hathaway, right? I might miss something that's actually quite important. Or I could miss Silicon Valley is a little bit different than Dallas, Texas, right? So this is analogous to density functional theory methods, where if the physics that's going on isn't terribly exotic, and that can be represented well by, let's say, a homogeneous electron gas with some stru shell structure thrown on top of this, it's going to do very well. And then if there's something that's particular about my system, say competition between localization and delocalization, I might have more difficulties. But in practice, this works quite well. And we can use this to study a wide variety of materials under extremes of temperature and pressure. So typically, we do density functional theory calculations. That's what we're calling it when we're just doing a static set of ions that are moving around. And I'll call it quantum molecular dynamics if I actually calculate the forces and let it sample configuration space. And if we do this for um, the materials that we're interested in studying, let's say, on the Z machine, we can use those Rankine-Hugonio relations that I popped up on the board really quickly. Basically, conservation of mass, energy, and momentum to figure out, for a given speed of a shock, what the material state is going to look like. And this can be really powerful, particularly in the case where I have some experimental data in my back pocket that I can kind of use to validate the approach. So that model of, in this case, what the interaction looks like of electrons of a different density locally um, can be validated by the experiment. So this case was an example of shock melting of diamond, where we had a lot of experiments on Z where we could measure fairly precisely the density and pressure that was coming off, but you don't have a diagnostic in that case for whether the thing is melted. So by doing uh, quantum molecular dynamics calculations of the solid and the liquid and potentially the, the mixed phase and comparing that to the pressure and density of the experiment, you can learn something about the phase diagram. Similarly, we did a, a quite similar thing with uh, magnesium oxide, which is a geomaterial. So coming back to our problem of the Z machine, right? We want to be able to throw these flyer plates without melting the anode and cathode of our, of our uh, setup. What we can do is calculate the transport properties of, let's say, that aluminum or, or copper flyer plate using density functional theory with a Kubo-Greenwood relation. So this is basically a linear response treatment of electrical conductivity, uh, the, actually the, the imaginary part of the dielectric function. And it turns out this works quite well in the warm dense matter regime. So once I get things hot enough that a lot of the electrons I care about are more or less delocalized, the density functional theory approximations just seem to get better and better. And the example here is uh, sort of combining this density functional theory approach with experimental data that was generated with that exploding wire setup that I was telling you about. They're able to sort of fill in the data. So here are the, uh, the Quantum simulation results are in red, and you can see that it's lining up well with the black measured experiments. And this was the information that was needed to put together the wide-ranging conductivity table that then was used to figure out what pulse shapes we needed to do to drive the Z machine. So this sort of laid a foundation for success that we used then to measure the Hugonio of deuterium, so hydrogen, um, a little bit heavier, it makes it easier for us to get the density response. So what was done are high precision plate impact experiments, where now what I'm drawing or showing here is the aluminum uh, that was part of that short on the Z machine is being shot at very high velocity that we can track with Visar, slammed into quartz, there's deuterium gas in the middle and then quartz on the backside. And by iterating through these relations, we can then figure out the density versus pressure of the shock states um, that were generated. So this is also a case where we can kind of come back full circle. Now I used density functional theory a minute ago to figure out the conductivity of this aluminum bit that I was going to throw into the deuterium. I can also just directly try to calculate the states of the hydrogen that are generated in the shock experiment. And in this case, these are these solid lines. And you can see for different choices of my approximation. So each line corresponds to a different exchange correlation functional, a different model of how the local interactions of the electrons are treated. I get either behavior like this green line that agrees quite well with the experimental points in blue and red, or I get something like this purple line. 
that doesn't agree terribly well at all. So now it turns out that we're not just interested in this small set of, of phase space that covers the Hugonia. We want to know sort of over a more wide range of pressures and temperatures what's going to happen. So one interesting thing that fluid hydrogen does is it starts out as this molecular fluid and then even at relatively low temperatures, as you increase pressure, it eventually breaks those bonds and starts to metallize. And this has you know, profound implications for geophysics. So for instance, it looks like the miscibility of hydrogen and helium that you might find in a planet like Saturn or Jupiter seems to actually be governed by whether the hydrogen is, is in a state where it's molecular and insulating or whether it's uh, delocalized and metallic. So th this was a, a series of calculations that was done by uh, some of our close collaborators in the Rostock group where they looked at trying to figure out the area of phase space where hydrogen was going to be miscible. Now the question is, you know, I, I showed you those examples of the density functional theory calculations not always doing a great job of predicting the hydrogen hugonio. If I were to measure this experimentally, would I see something that's similar or quite different? So we'd like to figure out how we can reach that state on a facility like Z. Now it turns out that this was possible. This was sort of uh, tour de force work um, led by Marcus Knudsen, who was a, a really great experimentalist at, at Sandia. And what he figured out he could do is set up a reverberating shock in this case. So the experimental setup's a little bit hard to see, but the crux of it is instead of having a, a sort of thick sample, now I'm going to have just a really thin layer of deuterium between two um, sort of anvils, if you will. And the shock is going to sort of bounce back and forth in between those two and generate a state that's, again, high pressure, but much cooler than I would generate on the Hugonio. Now what they found um, are these different uh, colored lines drawn in pressure temperature space is that you, know, you, you sort of have your reverberation, you go up, and then all of a sudden you get a very abrupt transition from the insulating state to the conducting state. And this was a bit of a surprise. So I, I mentioned before that we wanted to look at how the uh, ab initio calculations were going to do compared to that. Well, I've got these lines that are here. This is the experiment, liquid-liquid uh, transition, and then the orange, green, or dark green lines are various density functional theory predictions. So you can see, really based on what approximations I'm making, I could move that, that metallization by a factor of two in pressure. Right? So clearly there's something that we'd like to be able to do better from a computational point of view. So this is getting to the place where now the experiments are going to push our knowledge of how to do the calculations. Right? So this is basically what I just said. You know, this was a, a really complex experiment. It was difficult to figure out what temperature everything was at. You had to continuously monitor reflectivity. We'd like to have sort of an unambiguous calculation that confirms or, or says maybe we're on the wrong track. And the calculations that we've done don't really pin anything down. They basically just say the way that I know how to do these calculations isn't accurate enough to tell you where this transition should be. So um, one thing that I'm very interested in is going beyond this sort of density functional theory paradigm of you know, assuming that once I know the density of the electrons, I know how they interact at a point. So I've been looking at um, quantum Monte Carlo calculations. So this is a, a, a step back. So I'm just going to say, OK, there was this enormous partial differential equation that I wanted to look at and solve. Let's cast this as an integral problem, and it turns out that there's a method that's been known in the labs since Metropolis, since digital computers were really a thing, that does really well in high-dimensional integrals, and that's Monte Carlo. So the nice thing about this is that massive parallelism is available. I can scale this out to the largest machines in the laboratory complex, and there's a variational principle. So basically, as I do a better job of guessing what these wave functions are going to look like, I get uh, knowledge that the energy is going to go down and I know that I'm improving. So unfortunately, there is poor scaling, right? You know, this 3.8 terabytes just to store the information for three electrons. And I'm going to use stochastic, stochastic methods in order to get around this. So going back to my uh, capital flow problem, 
The analogous thing to do is to break into one of the Federal Reserves and plant trackers on a few of your bills, right? And then you're going to watch these things as they flow around the economy, and you can say, okay, I can, I can get some idea about how this is going. So the nice thing about this is that you really are sampling the actual transactions, right? You're sampling the full system in, and the frequency. And it parallelizes well, right? The more bills that I mark, the more that I can track, the more information that I'll get about the system. The problem is the same thing, right? I might have to mark quite a few bills if I'm ever going to get a sense of the full United States economy. Now, okay, let's say I've done all the work, I've made a code that I can use to do these quantum Monte Carlo calculations. I think they're gonna be more exact because the approximation is a bit easier to get a handle on. Let's, let's try it out. Let's see what happens when you try to calculate the liquid-liquid transition in deuterium under pressure, or hydrogen. And this uh, was shown in a paper um, by some of my uh, former advisors and Miguel Morales at, at Lawrence Livermore Lab, where they calculated with coupled electron ion Monte Carlo, which is sort of a fancy scheme of using this quantum Monte Carlo in static snapshots, but still sampling of fluid. Um, and they found, you know, phase transition here that is sort of sloped. You know, it's not vertical like the uh, data on the Z machine. But, you know, over this period of time, there were also other experiments that came out, right? So diamond anvil cells that were heated, and people looked to see if they could observe the liquid-liquid transition there. So all that really happened is that things got muddier in a sense, right? We don't know, we don't exactly match this experiment or that experiment. You start having to look into the details about how everything was put together. So that's not a horribly satisfying answer. So what if we go take a step back, right? You know, those experiments that we're trying to get to these interesting loading paths are, have a lot of moving parts. Let's look at the Hugonia, which is really quite simple conceptually, right? All I have to do is figure out conservation laws. So this is a calculation that came out in 2015 that did a coupled electron ion calculation of the Hugonio. So the same method that I showed you on the previous slide looking for the liquid-liquid transition. And what happened, and these are, depending on whether you look at it, like to look at it in compression space or, or density space, you get these coupled electron ion calculations that are much, much, much more compressible than the experimental points, right? Or the green versus the yellow here. And the question is, we think we understand these experiments pretty well. QMC wasn't doing a good job, and it's about the most expensive electronic structure method known to man. Was it really worth all that effort? Now, if we take a step back, we can ask the question, okay, the QMC calculations I'm doing aren't actually exact. I know that there are going to be some errors in them. So one of the fundamental things about Monte Carlo is that I have to sample a probability distribution. And the wave functions that I'm using, so I'm using some trial wave function to figure out where I should sample, and then taking the product of that, in a sense, with the exact ground state. So I've got to make this into a probability distribution. And the issue is that the wave function isn't greater than zero everywhere. So to make it a probability distribution, I sort of have to clamp things off and say, I'm only going to sample in the space where that product is positive. And that will influence the quality of my calculation. So right now, I basically use something like density functional theory to build up a bunch of single particle orbitals, put them together into a trial wave function, and then run my calculation. But I can do better. So quantum Monte Carlo uh, allows us to have quite a lot of flexibility. So something that I can do is build up sort of a class of wave functions. In this case, multi-determinants, borrowing how, say, a quantum chemist might start doing a more uh, precise calculation. And as I add more and more degrees of freedom to my trial wave function, I can watch how that affects the energy. I know the energy's gotta go down, but importantly, I can also watch the noise. I can see how the noise in my calculation is doing. And I know that once I get, say, an exact solution, that noise will go to zero. So what I'm showing over here is a small snapshot of hydrogen. So just eight hydrogen atoms in a box. This is my sort of toy that I'm using to represent the fluid that was going on in that experiment. Now what we had done before 
with this coupled electron ion is dream up of the most sophisticated wave function that we could think of to lower the energy. So in this case, it actually <laughs> borrows from Feynman's theory of liquid helium where they introduce this backflow transformation, you know, uh, sort of like that surfing dog that, you know, as electrons are moving through, other electrons are gonna sort of surf on that wake. And it was a pretty good approximation. You know, the energy was relatively low compared to sort of the simple thing where you just grabbed orbitals from density functional theory and ran. But this new scheme that I've cooked up with actually allows me to say, as I include more variational parameters, how is the energy changing? How is the noise changing? And I can extrapolate that all the way down to zero, right? So I can know how well that I'm doing by constructing a, a class of similar approximations. Now the importance of this is that we were able to go back and analyze how an error that I was making, so those were pretty small errors for electronic structure. They were, you know, half of a milli uh, Hartree, for instance. Um, but I can analyze how those errors are actually going to affect my calculation of the Hugonio. So in this case, what we found was that while the QMC errors were quite small, they were unbalanced. So this initial gas that I was going to hit with my dynamic experiment basically looks like isolated hydrogen molecules floating about. And this is something that Quantum Monte Carlo does almost perfectly. In fact, if they were isolated, the simplest approximation that I could make would give me the exact answer. But up here where I start getting to higher densities, that wasn't the case, I had this error. So um, the other thing that we noticed is that density functional theory errors were much larger, but they canceled. So it sort of did the same poor job in the initial state as it did in the final state, and that produced a really excellent Hugonio. But, um, you know, sort of cranking through, we were able to derive a formula that showed from these initial calculations um, of the coupled electron ion Monte Carlo, once we understood the way that the errors worked, we could see that most of the difference between the experiment in the blue here and those red points came from the, uh, the nodal approximation that we were making. So this is a way that the experiment actually helped us to improve our calculation technique. So the, the, the big theme that I'd like to leave you with is that theory and experiment can actually fuel each other in a really productive way. So in this case, ab initio calculations of electrical conductivity enabled us to do high precision experiments on Z, and then those measurements in extreme environments actually uncovered inconsistencies and errors in the ab initio calculations. So another thing that's, that's really important, and I'll just say this uh, in a couple of examples uh, at the end here, is that th there are limitations to what we can measure in all of these dynamic experiments. Things happen over a scale of nanoseconds. There's a lot of radiation um, that can mess with your detectors. So we would like to be able to sort of fill in these hard to observe quantities with ab initio calculations. And that's something that leads to a lot more work in the future. Um, in hydrogen, this sort of approach um, led us to a new way of thinking about our electronic structure calculations where the results could be quantified. So just uh, to, to give you a flavor of things that we're doing beyond hydrogen where uh, electronic structure is coming into play, um, one thing that we've been looking at for a while now at Sandia is ramp compression of lithium. So lithium is a, a fairly simple material that has a quite complicated phase diagram with just a little bit of pressure uh, at sort of room temperature, you can go through sort of seven or eight different uh, crystal structures. And we want to see what happens if we do a ramp compression experiment on Z and how we're going to go through these vari various boundaries. Will we re recrystallize up here at high pressure, for instance? So uh, here's an example of sort of the velocity traces that we get out of a, a Z experiment doing this, and we get you know, a few little bumps that we'll have to interpret in terms of this phase diagram, but we'd like to be able to calculate where those phase boundaries are directly from our ab initio calculations. The problem is that the calculations that we do produce energies quite well, but free energies are much more difficult. So Mike Desjardins, a, a senior scientist uh, in our group, actually um, made a method that we could use to analyze the trajectories of these lithium ions as they move through the simulation, get the entropy out, 
and then calculate the free energy. So we can use that to calculate these phase boundaries. Another thing that we'd like to be able to do on that sort of ramp experiment is directly measure the temperature. And our workhorse for that sort of measurement is to do optical pyrometry. So basically look at the light that's coming out of this really hot thing that we generated. The problem is when we do ramp compression, things stay relatively cool, so there's not a lot of light coming off. So one idea that we've had for this is to let's say, okay, you've got your driver, your sample, let's stick a thin foil of gold onto that sample. And we know that gold, as you change the pressure or the temperature, changes its broadband reflectivity quite a lot. If we could actually understand the properties, or you know, that spectrum, that reflectivity as a function of wavelength across the range of pressures and temperatures we're interested in, as long as the gold equilibrated with our sample, so stick a window on the other side of that, for instance, we'd be able to use this as, as a thermometer. Now the problem is that standard density functional theory techniques that we use to calculate the dielectric function aren't predictive for gold, right? There are these d electrons in gold and relativity that actually causes gold to have a gold appearance to you that are difficult to capture with our standard techniques. So we're looking at what can we do in order to improve that. And then finally, um, we've been looking a fair amount at using X-ray Thompson scattering on Z. So it's possible, but it's really a high noise environment. So can we use calculations in order to help us fill in the missing bits of information that this noise is obscuring? Nice thing about X-ray Thompson scattering is that it's a, a bulk material, um, but from a calculational point of view, it's really difficult because we actually are making an approximation generally that the electrons are kind of in their equilibrium state. They don't actually uh, respond to the X-ray that I'm putting in. So we've worked a fair amount on making a, a time-dependent density functional theory, which is a well-known technique, but making that something that we can apply at high temperatures as well. And that's allowed us, for instance, to do this model here where we were looking at um, beryllium at high temperatures and pressures, put in some sort of probe that looks like our, our X-ray pulse, and then watch how the charge density oscillated. And from that, we could infer the uh, dynamic structure factor and eventually the dielectric function that we could measure and compare to experiment. So um, with that, I'd like to take any questions. I think we have sort of an exciting uh, opportunity to look at how we can understand the properties of materials at extremes of temperature and pressure by combining these great facilities that we have both in terms of experiments and computational resources. Thanks.